Shim Hyung Rae was one of, if not the most popular TV comedians in South Korea in the 1980s. His signature character, Yong Gu, who can really only be described as a Baby Huey-style adult child with a non-existent IQ and a heart of gold, was so beloved by Korean children he was able to spin him off into a successful film career. But he didn't just want to make comedies, he wanted to make effects-driven sci-fi and fantasy epics, in an era where mainstream Korean cinema wasn't terribly interested in that genre. But he pushed on, producing and often starring in, usually as Yong Gu, bizarre features like Tyranno's Claw, Power King, Dragon Tuka, and the CGI-heavy remake of Young Gary, which you may have had the misfortune to see under the international title of Reptilian. But his most ambitious move came in 2003, when he announced his intention to make South Korean cinema an international force to be reckoned with by producing a gigantically expensive, for South Korea, special effects blockbuster featuring monsters of Korean mythology but set in the United States with Hollywood actors. Controversially, during the film's long production, Shim hit the domestic TV talk show circuit, making impassioned pleas not only for the public but also for film critics and the media to support his efforts out of nationalistic pride. If you didn't want his movie to succeed, you were against Korea succeeding on the worldwide movie scene, was the argument. The film he was asking his countrymen to support finally finished in 2007, Dragon Wars. <laughs> Dragon Wars is one of the dumbest, sloppiest, most incoherently assembled major feature films ever produced. The kind of film that recognizable actors who somehow wound up in it, like Billy Gardell, Robert Forster, and Craig Robinson, probably leave off their resumes. About 70% of it is some of the most inept attempts at big-scale filmmaking you will ever be privileged to see. But, that remaining 30%, that's also stupid, but also seriously some of the coolest sh you will ever see. We open with a big crater appearing in the middle of Los Angeles that triggers a memory in a young reporter of his childhood when an old man in an antique store told him his destiny, in the form of an ancient Korean legend. Yeah, it's one of these. That was the light from heaven. The light from heaven? So, in feudal Korea, a princess was born who was destined to be a willing human sacrifice to a benevolent serpent creature called the Amugi, which would allow it to evolve into a full-fledged dragon. Until that time, she's protected by bodyguards in the form of a warrior wizard and his young apprentice, who falls in love with the girl and decides to prevent the sacrifice from taking place. Complicating matters further, there's an evil Amugi called Baraki that wants the dragon evolution sacrifice for himself and has a whole army of followers backing him up. The would-be hero, the wizard, and the princess all wind up dead, so nobody gets to be a dragon. So there. But now, for no adequately explained reason, the hero and the wizard have been reincarnated as the reporter and the old man, and that crater is the signal that Baraki and his followers have come to L.A. So the chase is on to find and protect the reincarnation of the princess, who has also been reborn as a resident of Los Angeles for whatever reason. Something terrible is coming, more terrible than you could possibly imagine. Sir, that terrible thing is already happened. That's pretty much the entire plot. It's all just an excuse to drop ancient monsters into a modern city. And you know what? Ain't nothing wrong with that once it gets there. Unfortunately, too much of the film is spent playing hilarious hide-and-seek with Baraki. Hilarious because it makes no effort to explain how a snake the size of several city blocks hides anywhere or sneaks up on anyone. How'd he get into this suburb without being seen or heard? Or this one in broad daylight? How come no one can hear him climbing onto this hospital until the movie decides they can? Also, for something a bunch of dudes seem to worship as a god, he's kinda easily distracted from his goals. Go! Then again, the leader of his human followers works better as comic relief, too. But it doesn't matter, because eventually there's a showdown on a skyscraper. Baraki's followers show up, the LAPD, the FBI, and the army show up, and for ten solid minutes, Dragon Wars is the greatest achievement in the history of cinema. You got a snake constricting a building while fighting helicopters. You got fire-breathing dragons. You got magical knights riding dinosaurs. You got giant frog tanks, I guess you'd call those. You got military choppers dogfighting with dragons.
you got the army in a shootout with the frog tanks and the knights riding dinosaurs. You see? That's awesome! That's like the most awesome thing I'd ever seen! And then for some reason we're in Mordor. Seriously, I have no idea where this final battle with Baraki and his minions is supposed to be taking place. But the good Imugi finally shows up. Wait, were both of these things just wandering around LA sight unseen? Our heroine decides to fulfill her destiny, the Amugi evolves, and the film arrives at its title. Dragon Wars, or just D-War in its homeland, was a massive blockbuster in South Korea, but failed to register as anything more than a cult curiosity in the United States, despite a big theatrical rollout. Shim Hyung Rae, meanwhile, revived Yong Goo for another crossover attempt, this time a mafia parody with Harvey Keitel called The Last Godfather. It also failed at the US box office, but was successful in Korea. He's been pretty quiet since on the international scene. This is not your land to dig! Uh, you hey, have awakened them! But yeah, so that was Dragon Wars. Next week? Oh, just you wait for next week. Oh.